Hello, this is E599, E399, AI First Engineering. Thank you. Okay, we should probably get started. So I'm Jeffrey Fox and um, this is AI First Engineering. And Gregor, who's just joining, helps me on various things. Um, so we, we need to make some decisions about how this class is organized. Uh, I assume, by the way, that you expect it to be taught today, is that right? Because there was some confusion in my mind whether classes were 13 weeks or 16 weeks. I'm assuming this is 16 weeks. There's any issues with that? Okay. <clears throat> so, but we, I do need, I think, as I have, <clears throat> as I have recordings of essentially all the material, all the lectures, and we'll, as we go on, we'll record more. I, I would like to make this class one day a week, not two days a week. And so you can just watch the videos effectively instead of one day. And the day, the day we have each week is for discussions. Are there any issues with that, that strategy? Uh, yeah, here's uh, Gregor. Um, the time that we have for today from one to uh, whatever is overlapping with another meeting. Yeah, I know that. So yeah, maybe that's, best that's why to... I prefer to make this uh, class actually happen every Thursday at the advertised time and then cancel the Tuesday meeting because we have videos. Is there any objection to that? People are not very, they don't say very much to you. All right, so I'll assume that's okay. Um, so the next questions I have is, well, let me first maybe uh, just start a little discussion about the class and then I'm gonna ask people some questions because the, the number of students in this class, well, there are claimed to be six students and we have four here. So no, we have, we have five students, so that's not so bad. Uh, we're just missing one. And um, you're half undergraduates and half graduate students. Um, so we can probably um, teach the class in a way that is um, perhaps most helpful to you um because always i would the undergraduates and graduates we treated a little differently but the graduates would tend to do more software than the undergraduates so let me just start a very broad overview of the class by sharing my screen So can you see the screen? Oh uh, yeah, the screen is there. <clears throat> All right, so the theme of this class is that, um, which I, I tend to, I sort of give the term AI first engineering, it's engineering because it's, I'm in the engineering department and um, it's called AI first engineering because Essentially all fields, whether they be engineering or not, are being transformed by artificial intelligence. And um, probably using that AI is actually doing engineering. So it's sort of, it has a, a double meaning in that title. 
And as it says here, it's transforming industry, research, and also just uh, people's lives because uh, all the commodity uh, services are being transformed by AI. And so as we study this, we will see that you can, um, we can do this in various ways. Just some, one, we can look at the technologies that are doing this transformation. The other is we can um, just look at the transformation itself without but, but worrying too much about the technologies. Um, I, I put here that although it's the title is AI First Engineering, at this moment in time, all AI, all pra nearly all large scale AI is actually deep learning. And so you can say it's deep learning that's transforming industry research and lifestyle. Um, so, <clears throat> These, uh, I, I taught this class last uh, last spring, a year ago. And so these, uh, this, these topics here came from what I did then. And it consists, uh, that then we looked, I actually asked the students what they wanted. And I didn't actually, one area I didn't do was entertainment, which one of the students wanted to do. But we, we uh, at, at the time COVID had just burst into action. So we did a lot on health and medicine with a COVID emphasis. Um, we did a, a major section on commerce uh, or e-commerce, I should say, look, looking at both how things are sold and delivered and also how things like recommender engines persuade you to uh, buy things. Perhaps the um, largest section of the class was on the transportation industry which in some sense is becoming the mobility industry. Actually, it's becoming two things. There's a mobility industry, which is getting you from A to B and getting goods from A to B. And um, there's the transportation systems industry, which is the uh, total the system that controls this network of <clears throat> eventually um, self-driving trucks and cars and things. and make certain they operate efficiently. Um, in the transportation industry, there are at least two major technologies transforming it. One is AI and just, well, you could say that Uber is not necessarily all AI. <clears throat> Uber and Lyft also just have a, a very elegant uh, digital uh, app, which, can, which allows them to work well. Uh, in the case of space and energy, which was uh, requested by a student, there is a lot of transformation. Probably the major transformation is actually due to um, privatization of space. In the case of energy, the transformation is mainly due to renewable energy. But anyway, they're both transforming dramatically by those industries. <coughs> banking has a high AI component and there is a whole fee a subset of banking FinTech, which describes all these technological advances in the banking area. So we, we have a section on that. And so those five areas are the applications we looked at. And we could add one or two more if we wanted to. And then underneath these uh, applications are the technologies one uses. One is cloud computing, which I remember when I started teaching big data classes in 2012 or something, cloud computing was just getting started and quite controversial. Now it is totally mature and sort of boring. And it's actually difficult even to do research in cloud computing because it's so mature and uh, well developed in industry. Anyway, so we can discuss cloud computing as, to some extent. I have reasonably good lectures on those. Um, and then we have technologies, which as I mentioned, is largely deep learning. And I, the way I described them last semester, last time was in, ter in terms of um, taking applications which were similar, uh, which and describing them. So there's a set of applications, which is probably the largest set, which are based on images. Um, if you like self-driving car, the um, heart of a self-driving car is the AI to recognize, to interpret the uh, the lidar and vi and video images that the car car gathers, 
but th those image-based applications are very, very broadly based. Um, even in recent, the dominant research applications are actually all image-based because most detectors of, of results are actually image-based detectors. And then another last set of applications, which is another broad set of time series. Sometimes you can get time series of images. Other times you just get time series of observations. And uh, we did um, medicine and the environment, but we also can do other areas. In industry, in fact, Uber and Lyft success is partly due to their very good technology for processing the time series you get by looking at what people are doing, the, where, where, the, where they call in from, what the status of the roads is and things, and those are just time series. All right, so that's, that is the um, structure of the course. We have some applications and some technologies, and we're studying the, uh, the application using the technology, which is going to be largely deep learning. And then, we're, then in principle, we run it on cloud computing, but we don't have to do that in this class because we're not running giant, giant problems. Uh, so here is some uh, organizational details. Um, we used to use Piazza for these classes. Now we're using Slack, which actually is more commonly used in my community. And I think you all should have got invitations to Slack and several of you I know have joined Slack. If you haven't, please join. I gave you the link here, but you should have all got invitations. Uh, so we have these um, um, two applications which are actually 399 and 599. And uh, they're cross-listed. I joined them together in Canvas. And we will uh, adopt different grading principles to, so we don't handicap the undergraduates compared to the graduate students who presumably are more experienced. Uh, we have a, a, a website devoted to this class, which is already sort of up and running. And it's uh, all of this technology. We, we use GitHub for all these types of technologies because GitHub, we prefer, I prefer GitHub to Canvas and things for storing data. In general, I only want to use Canvas for homeworks and announcements. If you want to send messages, please use, please use Slack or a personal email to me. Um, I find it confusing to go back and forth. There are too many places where you gather data. <laughs> I don't, I'd rather just gather it either in Slack or, um, or my email system. Um, I will take these lectures, which I'm recording and other lectures and place them online. And those join together with the pre-recorded videos to produce the uh, course material. Also all these, um, all these lectures, are, they're all done in Google Slides and I give you the link to the Google Slides. And they will all be at this um, cyber training uh, um, website. And that cyber training website has various support material like Python, Linux, uh, using Markdown, which is the GitHub uh, text technology. And the course is going to be graded by a project plus a homework, final project plus a homework. And um, for uh, anybody, you can choose between a, a software project and a hardware pro and, a, and a written project. If it's a written project, uh, undergraduates can get full grades. Graduate students get, will, cannot get the fullest grade if they only do a, a, a written report rather than a piece of software. All the software I use will be written in Python. And for doing deep learning, if you if we need to do if you need to do deep learning, I use TensorFlow, but um, my students are quite I mean, at least half my students use PyTorch. Uh, TensorFlow and PyTorch are the two Python-based software. But again, if you're that's possibly relevant if you're a graduate student, with an undergraduate, it's not necessarily relevant. Um, 
So you can run your software anywhere you uh, anywhere that you find convenient, either on the Indiana University um, um, uh, systems such as Carbonate. I personally use uh, just use it for my 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 browser using Google Colab, uh, which I find which I find well well suited for deep learning because you get a GPU and it's. I pay $10 a month to get a better GPU, but it's the free version of Colab is quite good. And in general, I find the Jupyter Notebook interface to be much the best interface for this type of work, because you can define the software in an elegant fashion. And so I, I would recommend if you're going to do software in this field to, to both use, learn to use Jupyter Notebooks and use them. And I, again, I would also reckon, recommend using GitHub to store all your data and software. All right. So this AI revolution is entirely motivated by big data. Say so when I started this series of courses, Actually, with two undergraduates, I taught the first of these classes. That was around 2012. Those days, big data was reasonably controversial, and uh, cloud computer, all these technologies were controversial. Now it's not, well, maybe their application is controversial, but the fact that they exist is not controversial. So, um, uh, um, so, uh, and then actually the amount of big data is growing enormously because again, when we started, we just had the beginnings of big data, but now we have pervasive big data. And that is true in every, across every area, whether you be uh, shopping or measuring the mass of the electron or looking at um, the motion of uh, the melting of the, of the polar ice sheets, all of those are, have huge amounts of data attached to them. And uh, this data gets stored into these computer clouds and those computer clouds do training to drive models and then they do inference to make predictions based on that training. And so of course the, I suspect some of the graduate students from the data science program, um, the data, Data science, in some sense, is the field which is studying the um, the, the, uh, the 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 core ideas un underneath this revolution. Although, as well as data science, there's computer science, which is sort of deriving the technologies, and data engineering, which is um, taking the data and preparing it in a fashion which is allows it to be used to actually uh, make discoveries. And um, I think whatever's gonna happen, uh, if you can become uh, data aware and uh, be flexible and be able to accommodate different types of data and have a good intuition, you're going to be uh, successful. So one of the purposes of this course is just to give you that intuition. All right, so this is the last slide of this set, I think. And this actually is a very simple comment on why deep learning is dominant. I say when I started in 2012, deep learning was not dominant. Uh, and in fact, I didn't discuss it effectively um, because classic machine learning was the dominant um, approach used. But deep learning has become, had these incredible early successes, both in, uh, both in recognizing text um, translation and um, voice recognition, and uh, also in recognizing images. And there's a famous competition called ImageNet, which a uh, large set of images, there was a competition to try to recognize them. And that went on for many years, and they greatly, do, that particular competition greatly um, accelerated deep learning. Um, and so you could ask, why is deep learning replacing all mach other machine learning? And the, and the reason is pretty simple. 
Uh, when you're analyzing data, you have to make a model. Now, making a model is non-trivial at times, and sometimes it's trivial. If you just want to take averages, then you don't need deep learning. But if you're trying to make a non-trivial deduction from a bunch of um, people's responses to um, uh, to their to some uh, queries on the web or something, then the so-called model is not so obvious. And all you can get sort of do is to make some very general statements. And the huge advantage of deep learning compared to other methods is that deep learning is built around these networks, which are net networks of so-called neurons or pseudo neurons, and they have weights connecting them together. And um, the combination of these weights are the, the, the parameters which you have to, to change to describe the problem. And <clears throat> you can, the strategy in deep learning is to, to suggest a network, find its weights by so-called training, which is by feeding uh, big data through it, where, where the, this particular big data has a, is classified, so if it's images, you know whether the, it's an image of a polar bear or a, or a sports car. And um, that training of, 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 of um, labeled, so-called labeled data uh, builds this network. And that network is pretty powerful. It can actually then take, uh, be used to make predictions from. Whereas in the older methods of doing this, we had to look carefully at the image, in this case, the, the image or whatever data we have, and make some very um, image dependent or maybe class of image dependent decisions about how to apply various technologies such as uh, to, uh, to break the image up into segments and things like that. So the huge advantage of deep learning is that as it learns, as it's been trained on a, a huge amount of data, it's actually learned all these um, types of uh, problems you have, and it can actually take a problem you're trying to identify and automatically use the right network to describe it, which and then already has weights defined for it. So actually deep learning is easier to use than traditional machine learning, in my opinion. Because in traditional machine learning, you have to guess lots of things. Like I used to do a lot of work on clustering of data. Then you had to guess the number of clusters. Another type of deep learning, like support vector machines for classifying, you often had to put kernels to transform the variables to get something which was easier to recognize. Well, those kernels are essentially learned by deep learning. Um, so, Traditionally, you used to make the model for every application, but deep learning has effectively learned the model. And uh, this, this step from traditional machine learning to uh, deep learning is possible due to big data. So this says we only can use deep learning when there are, is big data. So that's not everywhere. Not everything has big data yet. There's a whole class of, for instance, language studies where there's not much data for that language. The small, small populations, then deep learning finds it much harder to get used. So, or else if you just have a smattering of data and you want to decide to summarize it, well, then you might still use classical machine learning. But all the problems which are, have a large amount of data attached to them, I think it looks, you can apply um, uh, big data. Yeah, uh, let me stop here for the first part of this talk. All right, so, all right, let, what do these chats say? Anything important? No, no they're right. all from, they're all for me, they are but just simply hosting the Slack join link. So there are some, some students that are not yet on Slack They should do this. While you are listening to the lecture, I recommend that you also log in into Slack so that we can send you messages. 
And then uh, it also says that you should be applying for a github.com account. And I will be staying on after this lecture to help those out that haven't done that so that Jeffrey doesn't have to have to deal with this. Okay, so now I, uh, I after that introduction, I want you to at least as far maybe for the part of the for, you need to think how which which uh, which aspects of this these uh, this problem you want to study. For example, how many of you want to do a significant software project? Do you want to learn? I mean, how many of you actually have learned know about deep learning? I know Jayo does. Who else besides? Who else knows? Is, you, you says you know deep learning. Good. What about the other students? I will assume the answer is no if you say, don't say. The other next question is: If you don't know deep learning, do you want to learn it, or would you prefer a class which um, focused on the consequences of deep learning rather than the deep learning itself? If you're if you're shy about I, respo responding, you can tell me by email. Okay, Paula. Oh yeah, I, I, I'm interested in, you know, learning how to do it. Good, okay, well, we'll then include yeah. that. What about Anna, what do you think? Oh uh, yeah, I'd be interested in learning it. Good. How about Baikun, I, what, is your, what is your status? Uh, yeah, I'm interested in learning. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, I, I'm also interested in learning. Okay, so. Yeah. Hey, says, I know Jayu is a super expert, so I won't ask him. JL forty JL one forty five. I is a well is a student I've worked with, so I know him. What about Jesus? How, what do you um do? You, do you, are you a great expert on deep learning? Uh, I'm not an expert, but I have like uh, done a lot of things involving like neural networks and somewhat deep learning. But I want to learn more about. How to apply right, so, this, it. so you already learned the most important because you see when I taught this class last year nobody wanted to learn deep learning <laughs> so um, that I made I did the class is has essentially no deep learning in it but uh, but I, I actually prepared uh, lectures and things on deep learning. I didn't actually give them very much last last year. I just made them available. So this is an interesting change. Uh, I think they were tired last year and they didn't want any 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 work. Um, are there any um, suggested application areas that you people think should be discussed other than the ones I gave? Again, you don't have to tell me immediately. You can just think about it. Um, I know you mentioned like mobility. Uh, I guess um, I was wondering like how focused, is it just like a small topic or how focused would you be on like using data for like self-driving cars? Well, that's what I have a reasonably long, I would say last semester we spent most, the, there were several topics. The largest topic was self-driving cars and, and the mobility industry. Because um, it's an area where the consequences, where the impact of big data of AI is most dramatic. But if the operation of Lyft and uh, Uber and the success of uh, and the um, is really quite dramatic. And I mean, actually, Uber and Uber and and the Chinese company Didi, they published the best work on analyzing time series because the, the data they have are time series. They have these series of events where people people call in and things like that. And so, and they have also all the traffic data. So the best work in that field of transportation has actually been done by the ride hailing companies. And of course, these all these companies from Waymo, or which is Google, or or Tesla, and what have you, they're all trying to to, to build self-driving cars. 
and you get these very confused statements as to whether it's possible or not. Some people say another 10 years, other people say it's all right. Like Elon Musk will say it's available now. So, but that's actually not, a, I mean, well, the key to that, as I mentioned, is the AI to do the interpretation of images. Um, so, hello, Riz, Riz, Rizpa. Hi. Hello. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm really late. I, I, had, I had a meeting to attend right before this. Um, well, you can catch up. I will post the record. I'm recording this class. I will post the recording. Right. Sometime yeah. later today, I will post it. Sure. Thanks. I appreciate it. And the conclusion of the, of the current students is they wanted to go through deep learning as a, and describe how to use it and actually use it. And um, we, as you joined, we were just discussing the application areas, which I gave the, them the ones I did before, which were transportation and mobility with the automobile industry and things, um, which is being revolutionized. Commerce is being revolutionized. Uh, one which we probably, actually, I would say probably we spent as much time as this last year as on mobility. That was health and medicine because COVID had just hit last a year ago. And so we spent a long time on that. And um, the area which was perhaps most elegant was space and energy. That's, that is being revolutionized by various things. And an, an area which we didn't, it's hard to find out what they're doing for obvious reasons is the banking industry. But banking is, and the finance industry is being revolutionized by, by AI and, and digitization. There's huge number, I mean, if you, I think in the, First, um, um, what's, what's the word? Startup funds, startups. There are more startups in fintech, which is the banking uh, AI industry, than in any other area. Huge amounts of money has gone into that. And um, one thing when we discuss these, we will see, I mean, it's probably slightly irrelevant, or it may not be directly relevant technically, but there's some important. Um, social and organizational issues with this transformation. Because if you look at what, um, you see, it's interesting to compare Tesla and General Motors and the banking industry with FinTech. Now, General Motors did not buy Tesla or did not buy a new, the new technology. It tried to develop it itself and is struggling, which is actually quite traditional. Giant companies find it very hard to change because you have a whole management system full of people who believe in the old ways of doing things and, and um, very hard to change. Where, whereas with the, I found it quite interesting. We look at what's happening in the banking industry. The banks know they can't change. So what they do is they invest in the FinTech industry <clears throat> and they see who succeeds and then they buy that company. So that's sort of interesting. So I don't, I think actually the, if you look at the banking industry, there's not, whereas it's quite likely in my opinion, General Motors and, and uh, Pujo and Fiat and things will go bankrupt because they're not able to change fast enough. I don't think that's gonna be true of the banks because the banks are just purchasing whatever they need because they are the ones that put in the money to actually stop the FinTech companies. Sort of interesting difference. But anyway, it's, uh, I think that, I mean, at the moment, it, it certainly, I think the speed of transition is far higher than I've ever seen in the past. And um, we've been transforming for a long time. We have various, just the invention of the computer, then followed by the web. And now, now the uh, big, big data and AI. I think big data and AI is going the fastest of all those transitions. Although the web actually moved pretty fast. Computers took a while to get going. But, um, all right, so 
Any other comments on that introduction? If not, I will finish this set of lectures for today. And then we will meet. We're meeting, the other thing we should point out, we're meeting once a week. And it will be not on Tuesdays, but on Thursdays. We'll take the Thursday class and make it the class for the for course, because so much is recorded. I will set you after this lecture with some work to do for the first week. And we will meet next, not, the, not Thursday of this week, but the Thursday of the week following that. So we'll meet, um, whatever it is, ten, uh, eight, eight, nine days from now for the next, for the second lecture of the class. And then we'll meet every Thursday. Is that, is that clear? All right, so with that, I, let me just finish these, these introductory lectures. Well, I mentioned that I um, started these classes when in 2012. I did a big upgrade in 2014 because that's when we started the data science uh, program here. And these, this particular um, slide comes from 2014, and with a with, and I've only updated it a little by adding deep learning. So. If you look at these trends, so these trends have been really happening since, since the, uh, you know, around the last eight years, maybe. And um, I pointed out already the clouds have, have come from being a beginning promising approach to a dominant approach. Um, we will make a few more remarks in the rest of these slides on jobs. And uh, these jobs have various, um, can either be in cloud computing, distributed computer systems, AI, data science, or data engineering. And one interesting technical feature has been the huge success of NVIDIA and its uh, GPUs, because those GPUs have been very powerful um, in, um, when applied to deep learning. And I expect that to continue, not necessarily, I, I'm not certain GPUs will continue to be the best approach because there's some obvious changes you can make to GPUs. Uh, but of course, NVIDIA has a huge advantage because it uses the GPUs for gaming and then can use the same technology to do uh, deep learning. And so they can um, put more people on the product because they have two major businesses which are both using GPUs. But as we know, Intel is having some trouble because it um, made a mistake and did not focus on GPUs. Anyway, these trends will continue. All right, this is one slide which I show from time to time. And it comes from an analysis by Cisco or cloud computing. Um, actually, they've stopped doing this analysis. As they used to do it every year. This comes from the last year they did it, uh, 2018. And um, the most remarkable feature of this slide is the claim that by 2021, which is essentially now, where maybe it's by the end of the year, 94% um, of computing will be done in clouds. So that's uh, the origin of my remark that Clouds, I mean, I still remember back in 2010, we used to go to conferences, Gregor and I, where people were saying, well, we think clouds will grow from 5% to 15%. But now that this year, they're 94%. And <clears throat> another thing will grow is the so-called number of hyperscale data centers, which are these giant centers, which have maybe 50 million servers in each center. I should note the one thing I tried very hard to do but didn't succeed very well is actually to find out how many computers there were in the world. Uh, and trouble is that that's viewed as proprietary data by most of the companies. And so um, they do not reveal it to you. 
every now and then they sort of release it. And so I estimated around 50 million computers in all these data centers. And <clears throat> so if you actually look at the different, they said so this, this um, survey from Cisco looked at um, the different forms of cloud computing. There's the public clouds, which everybody accesses. And then there are data centers run by companies which are just use cloud computing technologies, but are private. And the public one is growing faster than the private one. And um, that's the bottom left figure here. And one, one interesting feature is that uh, if we study cloud computing, which I don't particularly want to do this class, we, we've, we have classes on that, uh, which we can do um, when we to go into cloud computing. One feature of cloud computing is it uses so-called virtualization, which allows it to run many jobs on a single physical um, computer. And a typical cloud has some four times as many jobs per computer than traditional data centers. So clouds are much more energy efficient and uh, well, for the provider like Amazon, more cost effective than traditional systems. Um, so at the moment, clouds are going up 22% per year and they've gone up that pretty solidly for the last few years. Eventually they have to level off. It's worth noticing that traditional data centers are going down 5% per year. So they're still pretty large because they used to be enormous and dominant, but they've been slowly declining and clouds have just gone straight up and they're now far larger in, in number than the, uh, in, in jobs run than the uh, traditional systems. All right. So here are a few remarks on AI. Um, and I probably already said this slide here. So, if you again, when I did this class a few years ago, we used to talk about machine learning and systems like Spark or companies like SAP, which have a lot of traditional machine learning and statistics. Um, but although that workload is still there, the growth has all been in these large big data systems, partly because the big data systems are bigger and they run for longer. And so they're more likely to cost more money and give better results. And um, here we have a whole list of software platforms you might be able to use. But if we look at what we're doing today, it's going to be GPUs as the hardware and TensorFlow. And actually it doesn't have PyTorch. This is an old slide. Cafe 2, Cafe has been replaced by PyTorch. Uh, PyTorch comes from Facebook, TensorFlow from Google. But well, those are incredibly powerful software systems um, and have an enormous investment. They're, 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 it's very fortunate they're free because they're incredibly powerful and no, no, would not be possible to reproduce them oneself. All right, so if we look at these, this transformation, um, I divided it into uh, three areas, core technologies, the technologies that drove the transformation, the industries that have been created over the last 25 years, and the traditional industries that have been transformed. And as it just stresses here, the same segment. All of this is driven by deep learning and cloud computing. So, oh, you raise, uh, what, what, do you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I was just asking if we were going to cover at all uh, the GPT-3 or any other GPT modules uh, from OpenAI. Because um, I know like PyTorch and TensorFlow are, are like the most standardized ones. Well, we can look at that. Why don't you send me email as to what you'd be interested in? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So it's the opposite to the class I had a year, a year ago when students had no interest in the neat material like that. I'm glad to see it. Um, all right. 
So these are somehow a list of, uh, at the top is a list of core technologies. Um, and uh, you could say that the reason, I mean, if you ask what generally is happening, we're doing a digital transformation. We're taking everything that wasn't done digitally and made it digital. That's sort of a symbol of the web. But now we're going to the AI transformation, which is merged into the digital transformation. There is big data. Well, big data either means the fact that the data is big, but it also means this um, idea, which is embodied by deep learning, namely that you can learn the model from the data, that you do not have to assume the model. And that's very, very important. So big data represents a whole new approach to everything, including science, where you do not try to derive Newton's laws for everything and some fundamental principles. You just learn those principles from the data. And um, you still want fundamental theories and brilliant ideas and things like that. But the idea behind uh, deep learning is there's enough data that you can actually learn automatically what's going on from the data. Uh, another core technology is cloud computing with um, associated uh, software, uh, virtualization software, uh, data management software like Spark and uh, Hadoop. And then there's the data engineering that um, if you look at the whole process of doing a big data problem, it consists of, um, well, you have to find the data bring it to the computer and put it on disks and things. Then you have to do all sorts of manipulation with that data. That's called data engineering. And then finally, you take the plunge and you take the data and you apply your deep learning or machine learning to it. That's what I would call data science. Another very important trend and core technologies of the transformation is the internet of things and edge computing, which is that uh, well, the internet, we can take the things we've already discussed, uh, the automobile industry. Cars are becoming more and more um, places to have your computer. I think NVIDIA has put, a, uh, put one of their GPUs in, uh, was, I forget which uh, car manufacturers they did it with. And Tesla has built its own uh, car chip. So cars are computers and they're on the edge, obviously, because the cars are just, going independently all over the place. And then there's the internet of, of things, which is the collection of things at the edge from smartphones through these, uh, through cars. So another important uh, example of the internet of things is uh, modern appliances. If you go to a refrigerator, it will have a computer in it. And maybe your, your refrigerator will be automatically connected to a backend cloud so it can record what's going on and things like that. And again, when you, um, well, you no longer fly, at least I don't, but when you used to fly and you cross the uh, ocean, uh, those engines are transmitting data continuously back to a cloud so the health of the engine can be monitored. So these, that's called the internet, industrial internet of things. There's also a medical internet of things. So these two, um, set of appliances, the machines. Machines are getting uh, digitized. And um, in the case of medicine, medicine is getting digitized. You can buy little devices which hook up to your smartphone and, and measure all sorts of interesting things about you, including for things that Apple smartwatches do. Uh, well, another big core technology transformation is the network and uh, the telecommunications, uh, which is, I mean, it's actually remarkable with COVID that the internet was strong enough to cope with COVID. Think what would have happened if we found the internet was not strong, it was not, did not have enough bandwidth to cope with the huge increase in use. Um, that would have been pretty sad. <coughs> in the software area, there's been a huge increase in the amount of software, including open source software. The Apache Foundation has a huge number of giant projects such as Spark and Hadoop, which I mentioned, which uh, embody that. If you look at uh, the commerce industry, it is built around um, the logistics, uh, the digitization and the 
uh, use of AI and logistics to manage things and you know the schedule when you buy something and maybe it's made in Mongolia and gets shipped here automatically it's all tracked by automatically to make certain it gets to you. Um, there's an area which um, some people think is going to revolutionize the world which is that prediction has been made for the last 20 years that's augmented in virtual reality. It's still getting better and better, but so far it's not had these huge, um, uh, in, huge, uh, huge impact, in, uh, which was, except in the gaming world, it's had big impact in gaming, but it hasn't had big impact in the uh, other parts of the world because, well, like here, I'm not quite certain I have a game by being a virtual avatar in some virtual world, but, um, We'll have to see whether that takes off. Uh, there is deep learning where we have um, images, convolutional neural nets, that's what a CN is, speech with uh, sequence to sequence mappings and everything else. So these are the technologies that are driving the change. Then we look at uh, totally new industries. I would say the internet is a new industry. A remote collaboration, which we're doing, if you like, today is a new industry and uh, cybersecurity, search, smart homes and cities and robotics. Um, and actually some of these are pretty mature, like search is mature. Robotics and smart homes are still getting started. Both of them have probably got accelerated by COVID. And we know cybersecurity, <laughs> the people trying to solve the cybersecurity problems have a very healthy industry, unfortunately. So here we have some traditional uh, industries transformed. Uh, well, we have computing itself is being transformed where we've gone from various forms of computing now are mainly edge computing and cloud computing. I've already discussed the transportation industry, which is, I forgot to mention drones as a feature of the transportation industry. I put um, space down under transportation uh, so the, the very, sort of one intro, I was, actually I was in a conference in China where they were describing the impact of AI on the construction industry, because you had self-driving bulldozers and cranes, which automated to try to build roads faster. Uh, we know retail stores and e-commerce are being transformed. When I taught this class in 2014, I asked uh, the students, maybe 2013, whether, uh, whether the traditional male will survive. And at that time, we, these were un, Indiana undergraduates. They thought the traditional male would survive. I'm not so certain it will survive based on what's happening today. It will change in some important fashion. Anyway, uh, we have manufacturing. I already mentioned that machines are, gonna, are smart and they will be communicating automatically to the back-end clouds to, 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 to monitor their performance and give them instructions. A pretty interesting area in this uh, field is called digital twins. There's a whole um, activity which is doing, building um, replicas of systems. So for instance, at uh, Indiana University, I work with the people who are trying to build a uh, build a digital twin of a person. They want to build a model of the tissues uh, so that you can understand better like how COVID uh, uh, works in your system and things like that. But in general, there's a lot of uh, digital twins have been a pretty important industrial development to be able to build a digital model of whatever system you're trying to make work. Well, agriculture and food, that's still beginning, but uh, we know agriculture is being revolutionized by drones because you can now circle above the fields and decide whether those fields need irrigation or fertilizer or, or they suffered from flood or what have you. And uh, uh, food has a lot of technology attached to it. Uh, well, we know hospitality uh, has well, it's actually had a little bit of bad, bad, bad uh, impact from COVID, but um, we know that um, Airbnb, which went uh, public recently, has been quite successful. That's called room. I put that as room hailing. That field is entirely driven by 
digitization and AI. Well, the next topic I have is banking and financial technology. And that includes areas like insurance as being like you, there are techniques now which the insurance companies use to monitor your driving in the car and decide whether you're in, automatically whether your premium should go up and down and things like that. So, um, and actually the mortgage area is a huge area which has enormous amounts of money in it, which can be impacted by, by financial AI technology. Health, um, well, I had three areas here. Well, there's COVID is one area, but that's uh, the current application of AI hasn't really dramatically changed that. Although you could say that the development of the vaccine was far faster than normal because of um, AI techniques. Uh, but deep learning has had huge impact on uh, the interpretation of pathology images to identify cancer and things like that. It's now as good as uh, the best uh, human for uh, uh, tagging cancerous images. We know genomics as a, in bioinformatics is all AI, is all machine learning or AI driven. And another slightly different area is remote surgery, the control of a, of a, a, sur a remote surgical device from, a, from a, afar. Uh, unfortunately, the whole area of surveillance and monitoring is full of AI because they can now recognize your face and tell you to see if you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. Um, energy, the transformation is more in different energy sources. Uh, it's soon going to be true that oil will not be the dominant source of energy. Uh, wind, I think, is taking over the fastest, but solar has actually done very well recently as well. Science has huge impact and um, we can, uh, I expect deep learning to be used more and more to actually just define the basic theories for science. Um, sports, sports is a frustrating area in that there's an obvious, there's lots of application of AI in sports, <coughs> but all that data is secret. And so as I know, you cannot get any of that data. And so you just have to read the books about the people who did it for some commercial, for, you know, for the Yankees or something. Um, well, sabermetrics is the study of uh, statistics and things for baseball. But uh, there's so much money in sports, you can afford to buy supercomputers just to do the AI to make better decisions about which player to play on a particular team and things like that. Uh, entertainment has a lot, lots and lots of AI, the recommender engines which drive uh, YouTube and things, or the uh, esports and gaming and things. And we all know that news and advertising and fake news and politics and everything has got a lot of AI. And there's some impact on jobs. So that's it. Those are that's sort of what we're studying. These are the change, these are the traditional industries that have changed. And some of these I have lectures on. I don't have agriculture and food, for example, which is probably a pretty good area. Um, well, they're all good areas. The last few slides here are some, which we probably have time to do, are um, some old slides I dug up on the web from the Mary, Mary Meeker, I think her name is, who did these nice slides on internet trends. She stopped doing them because probably either due to COVID or because she got tired. But this just points out that the world has been changing already for, in the commerce, we've gone from general stores, uh, supermarkets and shopping malls and superstores, and now we're all e-commerce. So we've had a, there has been an interesting change or when the, the changes we see now are the result of many other changes. Well, this is this. This came from when I taught the class uh, in 2014. It was a picture of a of a closed down mall in 2014. But um, and that's when I posed this "no more mouths" question, which is still an open question. And this is a slide again from through 2019 which tends to show that the number of shopping 
number of stores closing is actually increasing. Uh, it's not increasing. I mean, the, the mouths are not dying dramatically, but they're just getting less and less um, effective compared to the uh, e-commerce variants of them. Certainly my daughter does everything through Amazon and things. <laughs> she doesn't go to stores any longer. All right, here's a little comment on a related area, the gig economy. I found this an interesting set of, um, of uh, slides, which points out that the associated with this digital world is the, is the uh, self-driven uh, economy of, of individuals doing things on a consultant basis. And uh, ride sharing is the uh, largest source of this. Uh, people driving for Uber and Lyft, but uh, it's in many other areas as well. Airbnb rentals and just general professional consultant services. So the, there's a nice picture of all the companies that uh, have gig economy workers. And uh, this actually points out pretty interesting that 44% of the population is self-employed in the US. Here's a, here is a couple, these are the, here's a couple of slides showing um, the age distribution that uh, most of the gig economy is between the ages of 25 and 45. And here's the increase in time, it's going up by uh, factor of two in one in five years so it's growing pretty fast this uh, gig economy and here is just the financial i found a slide here solely doing the financial uh, services side of that all right so the gig economy is being created by these transformations because it's i pointed out that large traditionally organized companies can't change it's very difficult to take a giant hierarchical company like General Motors or General Electric. As General Electric spent a fortune trying to build software. They had the right idea. They knew they needed to build smart machines with, with software and connected to the cloud. But to do it efficiently was almost impossible. It was essentially impossible for them. And so these large companies are not always doing so well. Um, so here's a comment on um, sort of a difference. When I started doing computing a long time ago, <coughs> the use in, in the business was in databases and a little bit in some areas like modeling the effect of a car when it collided and things like that. And the, for that, we, in that case, there was not a lot of interaction between the research side of computing and industry. But now it is totally different because the computer uses in industry are right at the leading edge of research. In fact, industry is leading the research. I pointed out the best research on time series is um, um, done by the right hailing companies. And so search, right hailing, um, social networking, these are dominant. Uh, industries with you know billions of customers, and they are all they're all centered on high technology, and for that reason, high technology has huge impact from industry, which was not true ten years ago, and was even less true thirty years ago. And you know it's it's essential for Google or Facebook and people to pour money into AI because the company with the best AI will win. And so they can't afford to let um, other companies take over the leadership in that area. Well, here is actually, this is the origin of the title of this course. Um, these are a set of headlines. I did this a couple of years ago um, about how companies were remaking themselves around AI. There was a time Google said it was, uh, Microsoft, sorry, said it was going to be a, uh, a smartphone-oriented uh, company, but now it says it's an AI-oriented company. 
And so all these major companies from Tesla, Netflix, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, uh, even General Electric is trying to do this. Uh, they're all AI first companies. All right. Hi, folks. We'll continue with the last few slides of this uh, talk um, after the browser crash. And uh, this is a little section on jobs and topics, because the topics actually relate to jobs, because topics for which there are lots of mentions tend to have lots of jobs. So if you look at Google Trends, which allows you to plot, in this case, over five years, the um, amount of um, search terms, which actually either look at the exact text or the so-called topic, which is a Google defined concept, which is broader, then um, you, you find that um, security is the top, which is normalized so the maximum security um, mentioned is 100. It's sort of pretty flat around um, 95. Then we have actually artificial intelligence, initially starting off around the same as computer science, but growing. Computer science is staying roughly the same. Uh, that's so-called, not just the, the search term, but the field. The things of relevance to us today, big data on cloud computing are quite um, um, small. No clouds have this little difficulty that if you just type clouds, you get a huge entry up here because it, um, is related to the weather, uh, whereas cloud computing is not obviously what your type is, what, what would be looked at if you just want to do actual cloud computing. And so in this uh, next slide, um, we actually have a little refinement of that. We have the artificial intelligence now promoted to be the first one. We dropped security because we've already seen it. And here we added some topics related to clouds, Amazon Web Services, Azure, which is the Microsoft uh, cloud, uh, Docker, which is a famous container software, and Kubernetes, which is another famous container software. Docker is the container, Kubernetes is how to join lots of containers together. And you can see these, these terms here are connected to clouds and hardware or software are growing very rapidly. Um, <clears throat> So these are, these are interesting hot fields. If we, um, before we come back to that, let's just um, point out the interest in jobs is uh, pretty broad. Back in 1920, there was this newspaper article, March of the Machine Makes Idle Hands. 1940, 200,000 people a year will lose jobs to automation. 1960, does the machine replace men in the long run? Notice not men and women. And um, 1980, a robot is after your job. And 2018 or something, will robots take our children's jobs? So people have been asking this question time forever. Um, and here is one of the answers. Here's the uh, comparison between local locomotive industry and the aircraft industry. So aircrafts replaced mostly what trains did. But here the locomotive jobs, obviously declining uh, from 360K to 120K and aircraft are going up from 95K to almost 400K. So actually a slight improvement in the overall job situation. So anyway, Transition gives change. It doesn't necessarily lead to disaster. Here's another similar example. Um, we know that farming is going to giant, giant organizations with lots of automation and machines. And here are the agriculture jobs going from maybe 12 million to 8 million. But the service jobs are going from 9 million to 20. 3 million. So that's a rather more different change. They're not quite so closely related, but it points out the jobs drastically change with time. Uh, here is a 
a different plot from a different uh, indeed.com. Indeed.com had these wonderful plots, which I show here. Uh, the problem was they found out they were too valuable and threw and removed them from their website. You probably had to pay them money to get them. Uh, and um, as I was a uh, chair of engineering, 3.7% of indeed.com's job postings. So, and finally, to conclude, uh, the purpose of this class is to make you aware of this transformation, how it combines AI, big data, clouds, digital savviness. That's what you need to be. And you can take a role in all sorts of ways. You can create the AI, you can make decisions which lead to AI, you can work on the big data, either gathering it or engineering it. You can work on the cloud, which hosts all of this. All of these are going to benefit from the transition and help the transition. So, um, so we've, um, as you know, remember I told you, I started this series of classes around 2012 as an IU informatics undergraduate class. And that was originally focused on big data or what we used in those days to call the data deluge. And, uh, Clouds were just beginning at that stage. I had a, an early project from National Science Foundation looking at clouds at that time. And uh, still clouds are a key part of it. Edge computing is a new part of it, the Internet of Things, which actually existed in 2012, is now even bigger. And deep learning has exploded. It really didn't exist in 2012, at least it wasn't in my class. It existed, but I didn't realize how important it was. So as I've pointed out, clouds are here to say, um, data intensive studies is, is very important, which is the big data um, field and uh, everything is deep learning as an optimization problem. I mean, deep learning, oh, I did an optimization now throughout my career because my PhD um, supervisor told me, Jeffrey, nobody looks at data. Please look at data. So I looked at data. Um, we, that's about all. It didn't say much else to me during my PhD career, but that was a very, very insightful comment, which was very helpful to me, because I've always been, I've always looked at data. And uh, as I've just stated, there's lots of employment opportunities in AI and clouds and all these data related activities. And these span both the technology company and the uh, Application companies, and you must be digital and data savvy. You must realize this world is changing so fast and both the technologies and the opportunities. So I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. <laughs>